Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Coming up on our program, he's been a political cartoonist for more than three decades, and now he's a Pulitzer Prize winner. The Sacramento Bee's political cartoonist, Jack Ullman, will join us. Plus, with the California Senate seat up for grabs, the leading GOP candidates sit down with senior political editor Scott Schaefer to share their vision. But first, Bay Area-based Tesla is in the midst of building what's expected to be the world's largest manufacturer of lithium-ion ba batteries. Tesla's so-called Giga Factory is rising up from a Nevada desert near Reno and is being touted as a potential game-changer in the efforts to reduce greenhouse gases. The mega plant is not only manufacturing batteries for Tesla's electric cars, but it's also producing a new generation of batteries for the home. KQED Science reporter Lauren Summer recently got a rare look inside the factory, and she joins us now. Hi, Lauren. Hi. So how big is this Giga factory? It's really hard to wrap your brain around. When I went to visit, it's just a small piece that's there, but it's 800,000 square feet already, which is the size of maybe a large shopping mall. When it's done, it'll be 5.8 million square feet. So that's wow. 100 football fields. And this is one building, one massive building where one wall is three quarters of a mile. But scale is what they're going for. The whole idea is to ramp up production of batteries, to ramp up production of cars. And why is uh, it so important for them to have their own production? Yeah, so batteries have been expensive for the most part. I mean, it's a big part of the sticker price for one of their cars, $10,000 or more for these battery packs that power them. So they're betting that with a massive factory, and this is gonna double the capacity to make lithium ion batteries in the world. Uh, with their own factory, they can drive down the cost of these batteries 30% or more, which they say is gonna help to drive down the cost of cars to make them more affordable for average people. And I had heard that once this is completed, this will be bigger than all of the current lithium ion battery plants combined in the world. Yeah, it gives you a sense of just the bet that they're making, right? That they're going all in on this future where they're expecting average people to want electric cars, to drive electric cars, and this factory is kind of the embodiment of that gamble. So you've got such rare access inside the factory. Uh, what did you see? Yeah, so they're moving in as soon as each room is done. So part of the factory, you could already see the production line humming, batteries rolling off the line. And then the rest of it is just the most massive construction site, you know, trucks, people, tons of noise, just room after room after room. And it's a, it's a lot of equipment, as you might, you know, imagine. It's, it's almost like a bakery, except they're taking the raw ingredients for batteries. They bake them in these big ovens, they mix them. It's just, it's just massive amounts of equipment. And they're often very secretive, as you know. Were there many areas that were off limits? No, we got to walk around, you know, a lot of it. No pictures in some places mm. because this is proprietary equipment in many cases. They're working with Panasonic to develop this, this Giga factory. And, you know, they're also a little bit secretive as a company, right? I mean, they want to kind of cultivate this ethos as being a very exclusive, kind of exciting company mm -hmm. where, to get their cars. Um, the factory isn't producing electric car batteries just yet, but it has started making another kind of battery that um, allows surplus solar energy to be stored at home. Tell us about that. Yeah, this is going to be really fascinating to see how people deal with this product. It's a battery for your house, right? It's, it's something you would put on the wall of your garage, and if you have solar panels, the extra solar energy you make during the day would get stored in the battery so you could use your solar energy at night. And people like this idea, right? The idea is that your house could run off your solar energy well into the evening and you wouldn't have to buy electricity from your utility. But would homeowners actually buy it? It's about $3,000 for one of these things. It's not cheap. Um, and here in California, there's kind of another wrinkle, which is if you have solar energy on your house, you can sell the extra back to PG&E or your utility. So if you don't use all of it, they will pay you full retail price for that electricity. Um, and that makes it kind of maybe not the mm. best financial choice to store your own electricity because you're getting a great price for that electricity from your utility. Now there's going to be early adopters that just like the idea of storing their electricity at their own battery at their house, but financially you don't really recoup that $3,000 very fast. And then taking a look into the future, uh, last month Tesla unveiled this new electric car, the Model 3. Uh, nearly 400,000 people have already put a thousand dollars down payment to reserve this car for something that hasn't even gone into production yet. Why is there so much hype around this car? 
I think there's a couple reasons. You know, one, this is their first mass market car. Uh, it has a, a range of more than 200 miles, which is which is good compared to the other cars that are out there. People like that. And then part of it is maybe the ethos of Tesla, I mean, the mystique. You know, they've kind of cultivated this luxury brand. Their cars now, you know, $75,000 before for some of the tax incentives. So to have a car that's $28,000 after you get the federal tax credit, I mean, that's a big draw for people that maybe have been waiting to get into the electric car market. And, and maybe saw that this was the real opportunity to do it. And I just have to, I just have to ask you this real quickly. It kind of related also on the issue of green energy. This week, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors approved a bill requiring solar panels on new buildings. What are the details and when does it take effect? Yeah, so this is for, for buildings that are 10 stories or less. So this isn't skyscrapers we're talking about. But starting next year, if you build one of those new buildings in San Francisco, you'll have to put solar on it. And it's a big sign from the city that they're very serious about clean energy. Um, and they want new buildings to play a part in that. All right, much news this week in the world of green power and solar energy. Thanks so much, Lauren. The presidential election is casting a huge shadow over the race for a new U.S. senator to represent California. Voters have a big decision to make about who will follow retiring Democrat Barbara Boxer. KQD's California politics and government editor Scott Schaefer talks now with three Republicans hoping to replace her. The three leading Republican candidates for the U.S. Senate all live right here in the Bay Area. They are Tom Del Beccaro. He's a business attorney who was chair of the California Republican Party from 2011 to 2013. Also, Duff Sundheim, another former Republican Party chair. He served in that capacity when Governor Gray Davis was recalled through the early years of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And Silicon Valley entrepreneur Ron Unz, who authored Prop 227, which effectively ended bilingual education in California. Thanks to all of you for being here. Thank you. Well, this is not a debate, it's a conversation. And we'll get to policy and politics in a minute. But first, each of you, tell me something that is personal and it might surprise us about you. Duff? Well, I think that uh, I've spent most of my time working in underserved communities, East Palo Alto, East San Jose, and what I've seen is the economic earthquake that we've suffered in this country. I can be spending in the morning where we've seen one of the greatest accumulations of wealth in the history of civilization and spend the afternoon with the people that are living at or below the poverty line. Ron, what about you? Something surprising, a window into who <laughs> is Ron Unz? Well, the truth is I have lots of friends over the ideological spectrum who are involved in politics. And one of the really surprising things is a lot of left-wingers and a lot of right-wingers actually agree in a lot of things, sometimes more than the mainstream of either party. All right, Tom, something more personal. What so, I, you know, I'm the sixth of eight children, and I don't know if you know this, when you're a sixth child, they don't tell you when hide-and-seek is over. <laughs> and so we, as a family, grew up, uh, had a lot of great conversations around the dinner table, uh, and I learned to argue with my older brother, so I became a business attorney, and I've been a small business attorney now for the last 28 years. And you grew up on Long Island. In Long Island, New York, for the first 11 <laughs> years, but now I'm here. Yeah, so you're all running for the U.S. Senate. Let's say you win. What would you like to be the very first vote that you cast? Ron? Well, for me, I, I think our economic situation is disastrous, and I think it's very important that we raise the minimum wage. It's an issue I've been involved in now for five or six years. I helped, I think, to move it to the center of the national stage. And for a Republican senator to be a very strong advocate of a $12 an hour minimum wage might really make a difference. All right, in and we're going to come back to that sure. issue. But Tom, what about you? First vote, what do you want to do? No question about it. We need to have the economy growing far faster than it is today. I'm the candidate with a specific flat tax proposal that is backed by Steve Forbes and people like Art Laffer. So our first vote should be to reform the tax code with a flat tax that will get the economy moving, weaken the IRS, and put it back in the box. But and why haven't Republicans you know, promoted that? I've never seen that passed before in the Senate. Republicans are in charge. I, and I think that's wrong. We should be the party of tax reform. We don't need government growing more. We need more of the private sector. The only way to do that is to clean up the code. The current code is the playground of special interests, lobbyists, and big corporations. I'm against corporate welfare. We need to simplify the cold code, make it easier for small business, and let the economy grow. We tried the big government way. Now let's try the American way. Duff, what about well, you? Well, to just pick up on that issue, that flat tax proposal was made in Reagan's era, and he rejected it. So I think that our three-point plan is to focus on small business because they are the engine of economic growth. So we have a plan to reinvigorate the community banks, 
lower the marginal tax rates for individuals and corporations, and dramatically reduce the regulations. You know, now it sometimes takes people longer to get a building permit than it took the Allies to beat the Germans. I heard you say in the East Bay a couple of weeks ago yeah. that you're, you'd like your, your first vote will be to kill high-speed rail. Absolutely, and take that money and turn it into water projects, both above and below ground storage, recycling facility, and the strategic use of desalinization. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about the economy and income inequality, which has become a really big issue. Mm -hmm. California uh, has one of the worst income uh, inequality issues here uh, of all states in the United States. How did it get that way? Well, in part because we haven't had strong economic growth. If you look over the last 15 years, median income has been flat. The proposals or the policies out of the White House have been geared toward Wall Street, which isn't ineffective for Main Street. So the key is economic growth. And what that means is, for instance, between 1950 and 2000, we had 3.5% growth and income more than tripled. But today, because growth is below 2%, income is going up much slower. In fact, but it's, it's going been up flat. Much, really fast for the 1%, for the for the right? That, that's great. And 62% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. What's key is broad economic growth. And, and that's what we need. And the only way you do that is to shrink the regulations and the tax code, which is why I have a specific proposal, the only person with a specific tax proposal. Duff. Well, I think I talked to the people at Tesla. You know, Tesla was the marriage of technology and automotive engineering. If there's ever a battery facility that should have been built here in California, it should be Tesla. Talked with the people at Toyota that left. Um, talked with the people at Boeing that left to South Carolina. It's the high cost of living in California. Housing, 240% the national average. Energy, 50% higher. Gas, a dollar a gallon more. But what can you do about that as a senator? A great deal. So if we solve the water crisis, we can build more. <laughs> yeah, that's a big if. <laughs> well, I think, you know, to be honest with you, of all the problems we face, I think from a technological perspective, water's the easiest. You just create the greater above and below ground storage, provide for the recycling of the plants, and if you have more water, then you can build more housing. And if you build more housing, you cr create great construction jobs and lower the cost of housing. Ron, you mentioned raising the minimum wage. California, Governor Brown recently signed a bill that's gonna take it up to $15 by 2022. Uh, is it right for the state to do it alone or do you really need a national increase to, to make it work? Or, and gentlemen, should we not do that at all? Well, I, I, I do support that Governor Brown signed the bill. Personally, I think $15 is too high on a statewide basis. It's fine for San Francisco, it's fine for LA, it's fine for Silicon Valley. I, I think something more like 13 or 14 would have worked better with the Central Valley. But part of the problem is, it isn't clear that Governor Brown really understood the issue because at the same time he signed the bill, he also declared that there was no economic case for minimum wage. And I wish he'd written, read some and, of my and, own articles. Tom. And that, this is actually wrong. For years, in fact, not long ago, a survey showed 90% of American economists said that it, raising the minimum wage results in unemployment. And 85% of the Canadian economists think that. So what's going to happen in California or in a place in the Central Valley where the cost of living compared to San Francisco is about six and a half dollars to the minimum wage to what it would be in San Francisco at 15, you're going to get unemployment. You know why that bill was signed? Because it's a three and a half billion dollar increase for public employee unions and it means unemployment for those in the Central Valley who are vulnerable, it was the wrong thing to do. But you guys are going to the U.S. Senate if you win. Uh, uh, no, should there, there be, should there be an increase nationwide? Or Duff, it hasn't been raised, I think, for eight or nine years. Well, because of the issues, and I think Ron and Tom make good points, the economies are so different between even Bakersfield and San Francisco that I think that the federal level should be at the lowest common denominator. But what I think is much more effective, and even the Obama administration has said this, is the earned income tax credit. Look, my goal is that anybody that's working full time shouldn't be living in poverty. I don't think we're going to get there just by increasing the minimum wage. Let's talk about health care. Uh, the Republican line in Congress has been repeal Obamacare, replace it with something else. First of all, do you, do you agree with that? Well, we understand that the insurance industry and healthcare industry has become a monolith that's tied in with government. A lot of corporate welfare with regard to that. So the idea that you just repeal it would cause a lot of economic dislocation. The Republicans long ago should have had a replacement policy. And what they're going to need to do is announce it, on, say, on a January 1st, and, let, and then say in six months from now, this is the way the new system's going to work, which includes selling over state lines, which includes greater access. Just having insurance 
doesn't mean you're getting health care. We have to encourage additional doctors and things of oh, that nature. We were talking about income inequality and there was a study the, the New York Times did just recently yeah. this past week looking at who's gotten health insurance right. and it is the low income right. people, people who are here legally, immigrants right. who are here legally, working class right. people. Isn't that a good thing? Um, what they, they, we missed a historic opportunity because we confused health insurance with health care. So now all the additional people that are receiving Medi-Cal insurance, they've gone back and studied whether their health care has improved it hasn't. So what we need to focus is making sure that people have access to quality health care at an affordable price. And that's why I think we missed a historic opportunity with this legislation. Let me uh, transition into immigration because there's a, there's a lot of overlap here. California has some, you know, two to three million undocumented immigrants. And I don't want to get into let's, we're going to got to secure the borders. But let's all agree that the borders need to be secure. <laughs> Uh, but in terms of, you know, here in California, the emphasis has been on kind of normalizing life right. for uh, people who are here, especially children, right. driver's licenses for undocumented immigrants. Is that the right way to go? Or, or should we really well, be, I think, yeah. I think what, we can pass all the laws that we want, but until we have that conversation, the people that have moved to this country that don't feel welcome, that the people that have been here forever listen to those concerns. To the people that have been here forever, that the immigrants understand that they feel like not only is their present and their future being adversely affected because their taxes are going up, their access to education and health care is going down, but they feel they're also being robbed of their past. So what I want, I'm a, I'm a federal court mediator, I want us to have that conversation because whatever laws we pass, just like with abortion, unless you deal with the underlying emotions, you're not really solving the pass problem. It, yeah, Tom. And here's the problem with that. Immigration now, whatever you thought before 9-11 or San Bernardino, is now a national security issue. And we need to address that immediately. And you know what? You can build a consensus nationally around national security. The San Bernardino woman took advantage of, of our visa system. The 9-11 conspirators took advantage of that. So instead of comprehensive lit lit uh, legislation and a long discussion, which Duff wants, we are very different on this issue, we need to build a national consensus do you, do you know that there's just yeah. a, an indictment showing yeah. that ISIS is coming over the, the border? Well, yeah. We need to refocus immigration away from just who's coming here to, to get jobs to national security. So Donald Trump has made a big issue out of, especially early on, about undocumented people coming here. You know, there was a lot of, he wants to build a wall and he wants to make Mexico pay for it. Just in terms of those issues of security, how is that conversation affecting uh, your party, your image, uh, and the chances of really dealing with a very complicated issue. Well, Donald Trump is framing the issue in exactly the wrong way. I mean, the truth is, I don't think there are very many people in California of stronger pro-immigrant credentials than I do over the last 20 years, but immigration levels are too high. It's caused all sorts of problems in our society, especially economic problems, because when you have a huge influx of workers, it drives down the wages of American workers, including uh, existing immigrants. Therefore, that's why a rate, big hike in the minimum wage nationally to $12 an hour would be so beneficial, because it basically means that the magnetic pull drawing in desperate workers to take any jobs available at any wages is eliminated. Duff, back to the presidential race. Yes. Though. How do you think it's affecting you guys as candidates with an R next to your names and, uh, you know, the party in general? Well, it clearly has put people on either side of the line. And my whole purpose is to bring us together to find that common consensus. And I think uh, we do have a very strong national security issue that needs to be addressed here. But frankly, I find 80, 85 percent of the people that I talk to agree with taking the steps that we need to take in terms of securing the border and making sure people that mean to do us harm don't Will come Will you here. support uh, the nominee of your party for president, no matter who it is? Right now, I would imagine that I would, but I will make that decision at the time that we uh, cast that vote. Tom, what about you? I will support them, and we have to change the immigration debate away from a path to gridlock. Duff fight favors uh, oh, providing oh, a status on, to uh, illegal immigrants that are here. That is a path to gridlock. We have to get away from comprehensive litigation, and I'm sorry, legislation, and what we need to do is refocus this issue on national security to which all Americans can support, and you do that through a step process, visa reform, and so what about the people who are here now illegally? 
Well, you know what? We need to separate out this discussion and stop lumping them all together because almost half of them are here on visa overstays. And there's no visa overstay party. There's no commitment to people who came here and are staying too See, long. And that's, that's so the key that's, thing. So start this process yeah. of, of and not blaming yeah. who came across the southern border for all the problems. Yeah. That's but causing division. Duh. I think people that came here illegally and have committed crimes should be deported. Tom has a different point of that, view on that's that. That's actually not true, Duff, and yeah. I've never said that. And you say that a lot, and it's well, interesting. It's not part of your plan. Uh, actually, I've read Duff, your plan. No, actually, Duff, All you talk about in your plan is the people that came here on visas and overstayed their okay, visas. Which okay, is, which is false, and Duff continues to say right. that it's Ro okay. Rubbles, uh, <laughs> yeah. But here, here's the reality. We should enforce existing law for people who come here illegally, yeah. and I think we need to do a stepped process. Really quick, we're almost out yeah. of time. Prince died this past oh, week, uh, had a big impact on a lot of people. Yes. One musician that really had a big impact on your life, Ron Ons. Oh, I honestly can't think of any particular Frank musician. Frank Sinatra, I learned how to dance uh, in the kitchen with my mom listening to Frank Sinatra. Tom? Led Zeppelin and Elton John. All right, last chance, Ron, anybody? Oh. Oh, I like Bruce, Springs Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and on that, we're going to be banned or run. Uh, Tom Del Beccaro, Duff Sondheim, Ron Ons, thank you all very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. The prize goes to Jack Oman of the Sacramento Bee. It's been quite a week for political cartoonist Jack Oman. He was honored with a Pulitzer Prize for editorial cartooning. Oman joins the Bee three years ago, but he's been creating political cartoons since he was a teenager. And at age 19, was the youngest cartoonist ever to be nationally syndicated. The Pulitzer jurors praised his work as, quote, wry, rueful perspectives through sophisticated style that combines bold line work with subtle colors and textures. Jack Oman joins us now. Congratulations. Thank you so much. That's quite a commentary on your work from the uh, Pulitzer jurors. You were actually a Pulitzer finalist four years ago when you <laughs> were still working in Portland. Yes. Was this win a true surprise or did you have a sense it might be coming? It was a true surprise. It's like hitting the Powerball in journalism. You, you can't predict how this is ever going to come out. I mean, th there's a jury level, and then that's five people, and then there's the board, and I think that's nine. So you got 14 minds to change. So. <laughs> and uh, we saw you uh, shedding some tears. There must have been such an, uh, an emotional moment. Right. Imagine being a 55-year-old guy, and you have been working towards something for 38 years, and. One of the funny things about being in the cartooning business is that it's a very small business. And so um, if you're good, then I, I've had people since I was 20 years old saying, when are you going to win the Pulitzer Prize? How come you haven't won the Pulitzer Prize? Do you think you can win the Pulitzer Prize? Oh. I mean, this has gone on for decades. So, yeah. so my main reaction was elation followed by extreme relief, <laughs> followed by uh, my strong desire to come on this program. Well, we, we hear you're a big KQED fan, and so Absolutely. we're grateful for Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I wanted to also get a window into your creative process. How do you know if a topic will resonate with your audience? Well, it, former Senator Howard Baker once said, what did the president know and when did he know it? Well, I have to think, what does the reader know and when do they know it? So um, it's a complicated process. And there are more sources of information now, so you're trying to think, you know, what is it that people are talking about? So that's my main problem. And then, so your job as a, as a political cartoonist is to push the envelope, to provoke thought. How... My, my job is to draw on the envelope, <laughs> <laughs> And you do it very May well, yes, apparently. Okay. But how do you, how hard is it to find just the right tone? Well, there's, it depends on the subject. I mean, we, we were talking about um, Charlie Hebdo earlier, and I was also, the year I won the Pulitzer, I was also president of the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists, mm -hmm. and so... Uh, we had never had an event like this before, and we were afraid of this for years. In fact, there's never been any sort of violence against a cartoonist in the United States, nor have there really been any violent acts against radio or television people. But did that send a chill through you, or did, you, did it just give you greater resolve to keep on what you're doing, keep on doing it? Well, the next day I drew Muhammad in a cartoon. Hmm we don't let the terrorists win. And I think that that was the strongest statement I could have made. How would you describe your style? I would say I have a flexible style. I, I can do a lot of different things in different ways. I mean, every cartoonist prefers to be whimsical, and I like doing those types of cartoons. But if 
you know, something, uh, a terrorist act or shooting or a, a war or whatever it is that comes up, you have to be able to react flexibly. And so I, I pride myself on being able to do that. What did you want to uh, be when you grow up, when you were little? You, you grew up in Minnesota. I wanted to be John Fitzgerald Kennedy, but uh, you know, no, I wanted <laughs> to go. Was in, taken. Well, I, I wanted to go into politics, and um, I was born in 1960. My parents were named John and Jackie. Mm. They named me Jack. This is true, and they voted for Nixon. Oh. So, oh, you oh, know, speaking of Nixon, so, I, I no, hear you I'm not mean done, Nixon. I'm not doing that yet. <laughs> you haven't finished my anecdote. So I grew up in Minnesota, right? And I want to be governor of Minnesota. Yeah. And little did I realize how easy it would be to become governor of Minnesota because I was on the wrestling team. So there was a girl in my, in my seventh grade class yeah. who um, moved out to Oregon at the same time that I did. And now she is the governor of Oregon. Oh, this is that interesting. <laughs> and I'm a cartoonist. Uh, but but uh, just real quickly, I mean, how did you decide you want to become a cartoonist from, you know, Minnesota governor to cartoonist? I really didn't. I, I, I mean, I kind of backed into it. I think so many people back into their jobs. I mean, I was really on a political track. Yeah. I had been a political aide for a congressional candidate in 1978. The, the only thing I really learned was how to drive a stick shift, which he taught me. And then I thought... Yeah. I, but I loved journalism. The movie All the President's Men had come out when I was a kid, and so I got very interested in that. And so this combines both your love of journalism and your love of politics. Jack right. Oman, congratulations on the Pulvisor. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. And finally, the Bay Area, along with the rest of the nation, is mourning the death of the venerable musical icon Prince. Last night, San Francisco City Hall was awash in purple lighting in the artist's memory. For many, his work is tightly woven into the memories of their younger years, and words of his death came as a huge shock. Prince was 57 years old. We leave you now with one of his many hits. I'm Tui Vu. Thanks so much for watching. For all of KQED's news coverage, please go to kqednews.org.